Okay, well, welcome everybody. This is um, our panel really looking at a, a terribly important issue for our times, which is climate adaption and how that impacts on the migration of people and the clash of policies around the world, because we are in a really unusual place at the moment where there's many different viewpoints, many different strategies and many different perceptions. And I think what we want to do today is to try and explore some of those perceptions, some of those areas of reality, and trying to maybe begin to understand how we can actually move things forward more easily. We have a panel today, uh, and I'm going to really just move to them in order so they can actually get their flavour. They will introduce themselves in their own personal way with their own passions. So, Andy, can I move to you first? Absolutely, yes. So, uh, great to be here, of course, uh, on, on another Harasses uh, panel. Um, short introduction to myself. The name is the name is Swiss. The accent is English. So, I was uh, brought up in Birmingham, UK, uh, with a Swiss father, English mother. Moved to Switzerland uh, just over thirty years ago, just to explore, and ended up staying in Switzerland. Um, Brief background to, to, to professional context. You know, I've been uh, involved in education, training, leadership development for the best part of a quarter of a century. Uh, I, however, got very involved in neuroscience, the cognitive neuroscience of, 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 of leadership behaviors initially, uh, around about 2008. Um, and since that time, I've completely immersed myself in neuroscience, behavioral neuroscience, uh, and these in, you know, written and done research in, in, in this space. You see, and, and then you come probably, probably this then brings me to, 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 to the part of everything. I tend to think of the brain and how people behave rather than kind of broader things like, oh my God, they're doing that. I think I tend to say their brains are, are doing that. And I try to think of what is actually happening. You know, and I think, you know, when, when we look at, um, you know, the climate change, there's, there's a couple of things that really jump out at me, uh, which are kind of like quite well known in the, the behavioral spaces. And I think we've missed a big behavioral trick in this area is we're talking about, you know, kind of policies and things we should do. Understanding policies are really, really important. I'm not trying to minimize this. The real key is how do you actually get people to do stuff? <laughs> I think that's the actual key. And how do you get politicians to do stuff as well? So I think, you know, from from my standpoint, there's been a bunch of things that have been missed, you know, whether it be all these these, these big accords, Kyoto or, or Paris or whatever. We've said we need to do this, but there's not been enough thought given to what makes people do that yeah i'm not even talking about policy level the reduction level i mean i think you know the the goals are probably well i wouldn't say good enough i would probably have much much more ambitious goals myself so it's how do you get people to do stuff that that's key now we're at this stage now which you know many, some people believe we're just approaching the tipping points and other people believe we're over the tipping points uh, and you can see these these factors happening and one is a systemic factor uh, and the other is a behavioral factor you know, the systemic factor is if you're trying to solve something that is really big and complicated, like climate change, uh, it's really hard to get people engaged because it's not simple enough. It's too complex. And, you know, everything I do is a very small thing. So, you know, I think there's multiple things have to be done, you know, but my big, I suppose, input here is saying we haven't given enough thought to how actually people behave and can change their behavior. And that's all people in the process, from the politicians to, to, to the bureaucrats, to, to, to broad governments, to, to the people on the ground, you know, to, to companies. Mm. You know, we really need, and obviously, there's an incredible sense of urgency. I just, you know, sit here every day thinking, guys, <laughs> we need to be go, 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 go. So so I think that's, the, that's my big message in a very broad scope is, We've got these things happening. We're going to have to adapt. There's no question we're going to have to adapt. There's going to have to be mitigation features. But we're not thinking clearly enough about behavioral aspects, how people actually do things and behave in the real world. And we need to approach that or give much stronger focus to that. Fabulous. I think you, you, the um, understanding the neurological connections around climate change is quite interesting and really... How, we, how do you deal with mindsets? 
Um, Absolutely. And I found that, well, my experience with politicians is they only listen to three people, the National Audit, Audit Office, the Treasury and the press. The National yeah. Audit Office can take the money away. The, the Treasury also has the ability to take the money away and the press can shine the light where people don't want it shined. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the, you know, if you look at the politicians, you know, they've, you know, they, they kind of, you know, the politicians that understand some of the stuff, but, you know, where's the motivation to, to change when they potentially face losing votes or criticism from the press or being called, you know, so some, some left-wing tree hugger or whatever it is. You know, some of these things that don't focus on, on crisis situations, focus on the upside. You know, it's not been enough talk about, you know, you know, the jobs it creates, climate change, the, 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 the you know, green technology creates, you know, about, about the jobs, about the technologies, about being leading, about being a shining light, you know. You know, if politicians were speaking in this language, it would make it probably a significant difference. Uh, but they're not. Well, you, you tend to need to find a way of creating change from the bottom up rather than the top down, which is where there's often a lot of vested interests. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, arguably in a situation like this, you need, you need both sides, you know, you don't need a top-down, bottom-up approach. Because some policies do work and can work. Yeah. Ricardo, can I move on to you? Would you like to introduce yourself and uh, just give us your perspective on this terribly important challenge? Well, thank you. And um, it's, a, it's really a pleasure to be here again in Horizons. Um, I think uh, that this is excellent how Andy has started this. So uh, let, let me first introduce myself. So I've, um, I'm originally Colombian and uh, I started as a, as a diplomat. Well, not, not so true. I started first as a, sort of a, an, an advocacy, um, doing advocacy when I was in school in the US and then want to be a negotiator on trade investment and later on environment and development issues. So I did uh, all the symmetry of the 90s, uh, the, the establishment of the WTO, the UNFCCC, and climate change, and biodiversity convention, and so on. So a lot of my perspective is informed by that. Later in life, I form uh, three different think tanks and institutions that have been active on these things. Um, one in Latin America called Futuro, Fundación Futuro Latin America, to try to bring uh, decision making into sustainable development and uh, bring uh, multi-stakeholder conflict management approaches to social environmental issues in the region. So very much on the ground type of work, but also working with policies in the, at a high level, including uh, with uh, the central banks and uh, ministers of finance and so on. Uh, then in uh, 96 and until 2018, I run a, a think tank that I was set up in Geneva uh, to deal with the complex linkages between trade and sustainable development. Um, and uh, that included a great deal of work on climate change. Um, since then, I've been more focused on ESG, impact investment, working with business and investors, and uh, uh, and continue to do my policy work affiliated to sort of things I've seen in Latin America and in China as well. So, so anyway, from that perspective, uh, of course, I do get yours and Andy's points, and I think they're excellent points on uh, how it's about changing behavior. I, because of my professional sort of distortion, I tend to favor solutions that um, that would have to do with adapting and crafting the appropriate regulatory frameworks. So issues related to governance, global governance, international governance, uh, international cooperation. And then from then on, uh, obviously looking at the domestic level, what is really the political economy? What is the, the institutional sort of the, the geography, including uh, of elections and, and interests? And, but also what are the capabilities? What are the endowments of countries um, to engage in a globalized economy? Um, and uh, all, all going into what Andy was just saying, so changing behavior for me, it's a combination and it's a, it's a right balance. And I think this is what we have not been able to do as, as a global society, is a right balance between command and control type of approaches. So regulations are very hard, laws, et cetera, uh, with uh, market approaches so that you can change behavior of businesses and consumers uh, by introducing the right incentives, but also uh, disincentives. Uh, and trying to internalize, in the case of climate, uh, trying to internalize 
the cost of, of carbon. And so that's where it came from. Uh, where are we today? I think responding to, to your question, I think we're in a pretty bad uh, place. I think that the, the, propos the proposition in, the, um, in this session's uh, sort of description is, uh, is quite uh, um, uh, just brutal in the, in the way that it states it. But I think it's, it's probably correct. And yesterday, the WMO, this is the World Meteorological Organization, released its annual State of the Climate report. And it's really absolutely uh, just daunting to see where we are and where we're going. So in the past seven years, we have had the highest, hottest records on in temperature in the world. This is, um, this is, this is something, of course, uh, very of great concern. Sea level has risen also to unprecedented uh, levels, and it's continued to rise very fast. All these extreme events that we saw last year affecting Asia, uh, Africa, North America, and particularly droughts, um, uh, heat waves, and so on, and then hurricanes and so on. So, so we are in a bad in a bad place. The question is, people like myself, I, I, I was first involved with climate in the first climate conference in 1989, and then in the when the IPCC was set up in 1990, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So the question we are asking ourselves is where have we failed? And I hope that in this panel we can look into some of these issues. Fabulous. I mean, it's very interesting in terms of the the whole topic of desertification as well as sea rise. Uh, I noticed that in China they're managing to push back the Gobi Desert with the forestation programs, mm -hmm. um, particularly with the use of the polonius tree, which grows very rapidly like bamboo, and it creates a, a, a connection into the aquifers. Um, and I think, again, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, the challenge is, is extremely difficult in many places. But again, this move to create this confederation across the center of Africa with the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, mm -hmm. you know, Kenya, and so on, provides at least an anchor to move forward. And that may also mitigate migration of peoples who want to move away from places where it doesn't work anymore. In Kenya, there are places where people will just kill each other to get grazing land. Uh, I think the veneer of civilization is very thin, and we have to have some way of helping people to work together more effectively. I think I'm, I'm particularly impressed by Costa Rica, which is a country where they disbanded the army, they focused on education and health, and they're now pretty much totally independent in terms of energy and its ecotourism and so on, and one of the highest social progress indexes in the world. So responding to climate change can actually also a positive thing in giving back uh, a greater sense of responsibility with the planet. So, Nicholas, do you want to have, I would love to hear from you. Sure, Rostan. First, uh, thank you again for inviting me uh, to participate at the RESIS event. It's always uh, very nice to meet uh, all these individuals and exchange ideas and uh, discuss uh, uh, the future of the energy transition. Um, so a few words about myself. I'm French. Uh, I started my career working for uh, large industrial companies uh, involved in the energy sectors. Uh, and I did that in Europe and in Asia. Um, then I became an entrepreneur. And uh, five years ago, I created a climate fintech company when I was based in Singapore. And uh, our organization aimed to facilitate the financing of renewable energy projects uh, by acting as an intermediation between project developer and institutional investor, professional investor, to help them deploy capital in this infrastructure. And we do that leveraging digital technology and to automate and accelerate the process, use, I would say, modern concept uh, to modernize and scale a very old industry. Um, and uh, in the last two years, I have been uh, relocating in Europe, close to Amsterdam now, and now I'm working to set up an impact infrastructure fund in order to uh, support 
and the construction of renewable energy projects developed by SME across Europe. And um, so you say the triptych that I have now, it's uh, energy infrastructures, uh, finance, and I would say climate finance, and digital technology and innovation. Um, well, uh, personally, uh, when I hear about climate adaptation or mitigation, uh, my first reaction is always a bit of a shock. <laughs> because I always understand that adaptation is required, uh, but the or is a problem uh, because the mitigation is mandatory. And the mitigation is the highest priority. And it cannot not be the highest priority. I think what we have seen uh, since the first COP and uh, especially with the Paris Agreement, regardless of all the, this, uh, the action and, 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 the, and, and, the, and, and the ambition uh, announced by the government, unfortunately, the global greenhouse gas emission have been rising aggressively. And last year was the highest uh, level of CO2 emission and same for CO2 concentration. So what we see, we see a big disconnect between uh, what is uh, being announced, uh, what is the ambition and the result. And so uh, today we have absolutely no mitigation. Uh, we are mm -hmm. still in the exponential uh, uh, aspect of the problem. And even if we would like to adapt, I think we don't know what we need to adapt to. You know, when you read the IPCC report and so on, they talk about three degree scenario, four degree scenario. But even a four degree scenario assumes that we are able to reduce our CO2 emission in the coming years. Since that, we have not been able to do but the year of COVID uh, outbreak. Mm -hmm. So even for me, the scenarios that we are working against in our adaptation program are not realistic today because I have no, I, there is no proof that we have been able to bring back uh, our CO2 emission under control. And, and so I think the obsession should be about mitigation and about the phasing out of fossil fuel and the displacement with uh, low carbon energy. And uh, my, my activities at the core of this, so I think, um, you know, every day I try to understand why is it not happening faster? What, what are the roadblocks? And I think then we go to the two things that have been mentioned before. Uh, first, uh, uh, there is a lot of work that needs to happen on the regulatory landscape uh, because to break this um, existing value chain of the fossil fuel industry, you need the power of the politicians. Nobody else can break it. And at the same time, you need uh, uh, to uh, um, engage people and people need to, I would say, uh, be part of this change. And we cannot do this change without uh, the people. So we need to work on both, uh, both aspects at the same time. I think it's very interesting. Um, we probably you know the the, the fossil fuel companies uh, you know in terms of us to uh, reduce uh, dependence it's like turkey's voting for christmas you know they uh, particularly when you have such a huge increases in uh, the, the cost of uh, fossil fuels at the moment i think i'm surprised that nobody's really looking at closer at things like thorium reactors where you can get nuclear power but without all the downsides of decommission costs and I know the Chinese are making massive investments in that at the moment. Um, I think there's clearly a, a reduction of energy as being a requirement, as, a, as well as a, a, a looking at alternative sources. I mean, if you look at the energy requirement in the US per household, it's significantly different from the, the energy requirement in Europe. Um, we have to create this responsibility in people um, as I think we're all agreeing now that the, the rate of climate change is much, much faster than people had imagined, and it may be unstoppable now. Uh, nobody really mentions methane. Uh, we talk about carbon dioxide, but there's huge releases of methane into the atmosphere from in the sea, in the tundras, uh, and that probably has a worse effect than carbon dioxide. 
So we have to really look at all the parameters of this problem. I'm delighted that Kristen's joined us. Uh, she's speaking last on this occasion, but will also give us the benefit of the woman's view. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I, I was in with a iPad phone and I couldn't get in. I didn't read the whole thing, I guess. But anyway, so I'm glad to meet you all. So um, I was reflecting the other day um, on also alter alternative fuel and that we really have to reflect on that as well. Um, coming from Norway, which has obviously a number one uh, sort of uh, oil and gas industry, very big, but also a lot of wind and a lot of um, hydro and a lot of everything. But it's also, we had to really think twice now when we are windmills that are ruining a lot of birds and what is the better thing? Is this also a profitable thing that now we're going to move for making more money out of something that actually ultimately is not that much better because it also ruins nature and it also ruins our planet. So we have to be really smart, I think, because um, I see the consequences also of that. And second thing is also um, the technology to even making fossil fuel more like they're already doing now that you can use a little bit right now instead of the vast consumption of the past. So by having cars consuming less and the extraction being a lot better with new technology, already that is now a lot better than it was. So, um, so I think that we really reflect a lot and not just jump on some new technology because it's an alternative to what we had, but maybe is it that much better? So that's something I, I was thinking on a, on a lot. Um, so, so therefore, it's it's important that this is reflected on a lot and not just jumped on as a new fad, uh, <laughs> because uh, there is also um, consequence of some of the alternative technologies. I'm, I'm very conscious that we we look at um, electrification of cars as an issue, and they use lithium batteries, which yeah, are lithium is horrendously to toxic to extract, and it has, if you take a lithium battery, it has about 3,000 cycles. And every time you rapid charge it, you lose about 20 cycles. And then what do you do with it then? I mean, um, most of the suppliers of lithium batteries don't have a solution for recycling. Uh, so, I mean, Renault have actually been giving it to domestic buffers for households and passing the problem on. But we have a, a horrendous problem of what, what what do you actually do with it and uh, so I, I think we need to look at also at things like uh, super capacitor batteries which give you which have a better chance of something like a thousand times the capacity of a conventional battery and a twelfth of the weight and then looking maybe at hydrogen which can be redu reduced at source you know you can have there's now hydrogen generation facilities at service stations uh, I know in Switzerland uh, the Gallica family are have to change all their trucks by 2030 and they're looking at hydrogen as being the the, the solution and they're working with Mitsubishi which has high hydrogen fuel cells so I think we we have to driving this process of how do we reduce the contamination of the planet how do we create a, a mechanism where hydrogen when it actually goes through a fuel cell produces water so you, you and, and I think we'd really need to start to look at um, carbon dioxide sequestration strategies and you can the technology of carbon dioxide scrubbing is now beginning to get more interesting they can put the carbon dioxide scrubbers in cities so where the carbon dioxide is worse you can start to do something about it but i think we are moving also from a, a city-based civilization to more and more people living outside of cities in micro villages and we where they can be self-sustaining and I think that C-Spot we're focused on building village type communities where they can be self-sustaining for energy, water and food. Therefore, you haven't got transport costs. The, the water is pure and, and the food system is pure in the sense it uses the, the approach of the three sisters from Latin America where you, you can have a certain basic foods which can give total nutrition. And again, for people coming back to the, the neurological aspect, if you give clean water, good nutrition, exercise, meditation, and sleep, the body's biosystem is in a much better place. And when you, when people are in a good place and they're safe and secure, they create a resonance field to the people around them. They're much more prepared to work together and you move away from survival strategies. 
And I would add that I think women are the most important element of that because women are the anchors in communities. And we're just beginning to see this grandmother effect, which, you know, when the grandmothers decide something, they uh, it's usually formidable. I mean, I'm reminded of uh, Redditch in Birmingham in, in the UK. The grandmothers decided they'd had enough of the violence, the prostitution, the drugs and the crime. It all ended in six months. The grandmothers decided in Lancashire, it was called the Lancashire Nans, to stop fracking. It also ended in six months. So maybe we need to draw from the wisdom of the Hopi Indians who said, when you empower the grandmothers, you will have peace, safety and security on the planet. An interesting conversation, maybe. Uh, a couple of, I mean, a couple of comments from my side. I mean, I think that we've covered lots of topics of which I'd, <laughs> like to comment, I'd like to comment on, but I'd be speaking for another forty-five minutes. Yeah. You know, I think on 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 the comment of technologies, I think that, that, that this is well known and is of concern. You know, this kind of, the, the whole life cycle, you know, pollution as a broader sense of um, uh, of aspects. You know, just to bring back to my personal thing you know it's kind of like you know how to get behaviors to change you know what i noticed you know and i was just recently in the uk with my family you know but but speaking to let's say what we'd call the normal people you know this is not academics like hers or people who are kind of like on, on her ass's panels this is kind of like just people who are going about the, the daily life mostly uh working class people what do they actually care about do they talk about climate change the answer is no they don't. <laughs> they don't really care. They just go, oh, all this climate stuff. Yeah. So the, the question is, how do you get to those people? You know, and the and on the concept of cars, the reality is most people don't actually care that much if the car is, you know, petrol driven and gas, or it's electric or it's hydrogen. They just really care of if it does get you from place A to B in a really nice way, in a nice style, and it's basically cheap to run. You know, if it costs 20, 30% more, you're already on a big no-no. If you're going to run out of electricity, now, I think electricity is a good place, but if you don't have hydrogen charging stations. So I think, you know, thinking of what actually drives the person on the ground <laughs> is what's going to change that, you know. I, I'd agree car, uh, hydrogen technology is probably <laughs> the much better way to go. But again, the man on the street, doesn't care that much about hydrogen or electricity or petrol. They care about the practicalities of it. Yeah. And I think we have to bear that in mind because you can have great technology, but if it's just super expensive or impractical, it's not going to gain the traction or gain the traction quick enough, put it that way. You know, we know we have to move quickly. Maybe one, one comment on this. I, I, um, um, I think there has been a lot of uh, misinformation work done by the fossil fuel industry for putting down some of the very obvious solution to the climate crisis. And the typical lobbying activity that we see is campaign around against wind farm installation. And um, other activity has been the debate around electrical car and hydrogen car. Other solution has been the impact of the supply chain linked to battery technology. And I think all this is associated with lobbying campaign from the fossil fuel industry to communicate misinformation to the people. Yeah. And I think we should be very careful in a panel like us to done some echo to such kind of communication. Because if you look at the program recommended by the IPCC, or by the different governmental agency in charge of the energy transition, the pillars are always the same. The pillars are massive deployment of renewable, mainly solar and wind, massive scale up of storage technology, mainly batteries technology, electrification, mainly electrical vehicles. You see that in Europe, your, uh, electric vehicle will be mandatory almost by 2030, and there will be no IC vehicle on the road, new vehicle by 2035, and also increase of energy efficiency program. And so the, 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 the solution to do 80% of the job we have to do to mitigate climate change are known. They are validated by the scientific communities. They just need to be accelerated and deployed at scale. But it's not an easy walk. 
because the opposition is very strong. The opposition has been for very long the, one of the strongest industry and the richest industry in the world. Even right now, the most lucrative company in the world are for the company. The highest capitalization company in the world is a fossil fuel company. So you, this, this transition is not going to be, to be a walk in a park. And uh, the access to scientific fact-based information is not always easy. And I encourage everybody to, you know, go back to the IPCC report. The IPCC report is a work done by a large community of scientists, the largest maybe community of scientists never gather in the world to address a world issue. And the conclusion are very sharp and very clear. And okay. they recommend solar, wind, electrical vehicle, energy efficiency, massive electrification, and the phase out of fossil fuel, including coal, gas, and oil. I think, yes, we must be mindful of fake news, which is a, a, a paradigm of our age, unfortunately. Ricardo, you wanted to say something. Yes, no, I, I think I just wanted to take sort of the... the, the cue from there, from, from what both Andy and Nicholas have said. And I think that... Um, um, well, if, if you look at the evolution of, of energy sources from 1850 to today, what you see is a sort of a, the, the progression that really goes into what is more um, cost efficient uh, and then what gives you really um, more to society. So what can be really spread in its use and, and, and so on. And, uh, and that's how we got into, into coal and oil and gas. Um, now, what, what we need, as we said before, in the context of climate change is to not lose track of the situation where it is concentration of CO2 uh, emissions as well as methane and other gases that are causing the problem. And therefore, move into uh, making sure that the right incentives, and again, as I said before, regulations of the type of command and control are in place to help us move away of this cheap uh, technologies of, of fossil fuels into what may be more expensive. Of course, technologies and more technologies, uh, they, they, they need to be fine-tuned. New ones that are emerging need to be uh, proven. And uh, all these um, issues that have been raised about um, sort of the, the um, windmills and the, and the birds and so on, they're, they're all absolutely valid. But we need to make sure that we understand what, it's, what is the cost-benefit analysis of what we're doing. And, I, and I, I can't, I think, overemphasize how incredibly critical it is to really put the emphasis on the need to reduce the emissions. That's just it. Now, so, it, of course, I, 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 I don't think that, um, um, that we have a panacea either with windmills or with nuclear as it is or with hydrogen or green hydrogen once we get there. But I do think that we need to continue uh, to try to to um, internalize the cost of emissions to the fossil fuel technologies and uh, let markets, science, uh, consumers, and so on. Um, and at the same time, we need to emphasize, I think what Rolson was saying before, we need to emphasize use of technologies and, um, and efficiency. I think that the measure of, um, of per capita emissions, the intensity of emissions, it's absolutely critical. I and mean, we got to a point where this is not political anymore. Uh, it's not about aggregates that don't make much sense. It's about really understanding who is emitting what and then trying to get to, to that level to try to reduce uh, those emissions. So, so what I'm saying is we're, we're really in an emergency. I mean, we've been calling this for 32 years since I'm involved in it, at least. And, uh, and, and we're incredibly late for what we're doing. No, if, uh, it, I think a lot of it is in the right direction. If you look at the, the efforts in Europe, um, just the, over the weekend, the transatlantic effort to reestablish cooperation on, the, on trade technology, including on, on the renewable en energies, finding common methodologies to try to approach the very um, sort of dismal question of how to measure the embedded carbon in, in goods and in production. 
um, all these kind of things, they're in the right direction. But we should have been doing this 15 or 20 years ago. We don't yeah. have much time. And I, I don't want to sound fat on this. But if you look at the state of the climate report of yesterday, you look at the IPCC report, we don't have much time. We really need a very rapid scale up of the substitutes of fossil fuels. And one, one last question there, that one last issue there is that with the conflict, so we're living through this triple uh, crisis right now of the COVID, the conflict and climate. And, and, and the, I think what's important is that COVID and the conflict do not um, take, again, the eyes off the ball of what we need to do medium and longer term. So now, obviously, everybody's scrambling for gas and fossil fuels for the next winter. And in doing so, they're reversing the kind of measures and incentives to move away from fossil fuels, for instance, in Africa. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but I think there's, there's a very big word of caution on making sure that, again, the conflict doesn't end up in just making things worse from the climate perspective, because that's a longer term existential uh, issue that we all yeah. share. I think one of the things we're drawing from this is the need for a long term plan, but a plan that is deliverable. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of Africa, where they had a, uh, a long term 40 year plan. And after a few years, they decided that nothing had actually happened, which is a certain slight hint of that in climate change. And then now have another plan for 2063. Um, we need to get to the place where we're doing things that are real. If you are a student of complexity science, you'll know that if you're operating on the edge of chaos, which is probably where we are, 80% um, of the outcomes will be driven by intangibles, which is probably people. Um, and I think women are incredibly important power base to actually bring those intangibles to, into the public domain. Um, and I think I'll pass over to Kristen because I always... Yes, because it's interesting what you're all saying. Um, about 30 years ago, Gruhal and Brundtland wrote the um, report on the sustainable development. And I, I was part of a youth group at the time and we went to Tokyo. It was a global meeting. Everybody talked about it. The same discussion as right now. Nothing has changed. And, um, and it isn't uh, so much more about talking. It's a lot more about listening and including listening to indigenous people or people on the land, like I'm, I'm a very against windmills, as you probably understood, <laughs> because there are animals that are in that area, there are birds that die and all this type of thing. So we can find other alternative or you put them far out in the ocean. But again, every 15 years, those incredibly large mill mills also need to go somewhere. But it's about listening. And that was the point, actually listening to the people who work with the land, listening to indigenous people listening to those that are speak about this and 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 also work on our mindsets because um if we need to train ourselves in our own behavior and right now we have a horrible economic system everything is governed by making profit also about the sustainability far too much so yeah we put these windmills or whatever it is in order to squeeze it to get money out of it. And that's a problem, obviously, with the fossil fuels also. So we need to rethink a new economic model. So it's not about taking advantage of in, in the name of profit, not even this. And and this is, I think, is, is a, a root of the problem because why are we cutting down the forest in Brazil, in the Amazon? If someone wants to make money out of it and we are letting it happen. I think the tragedy in North... Can I make North... a comment to that? Because I think it's... I mean, what you've just said, is, because this, this is something I'm really big on because... You know, and, and, and in economics, it's, it's simply called externalities. Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't priced in externalities. So we haven't priced in the cost of damage to the environment. Uh, but we also haven't priced in uh, the cost to maintain an environment. You know, and, you know, the, the Brazilian example is an interesting example. We also keep the rainforest, whereas yeah. obviously in Europe, we've wiped out all our forests <laughs> yes. hundreds of years ago. Uh, and now we're in Europe saying, keep the forests there, keep the forests there. You know, we've wiped out ours. But the, the, the fact is the economy, the global economy should pay for the rainforests. Uh, the global economy should pay for the damage that climate change cool. does. We haven't priced it in. So it's mm -hmm. not a problem of yeah. economics per se. It's the problem of bad economics. <laughs> yes, in, yes, in bad economics. Yes, yes. It's not priced in. It needs to be priced in. <laughs> You know, but it, it, it's not it's, priced in, it won't happen. It's an ulcer as well, in a sense, I'm reminded of Scotland, where yeah. it used to be covered completely with forests, 
And then because of the yeah. economics of sheep farming, the sheep always eat the trees yeah, before they have a chance to grow. So we, but, yeah, yeah. It's, but uh, again, again, Royston, I think that's the same point is, is how do you make sure that the incentives of people are such that it is better to keep the forest uh, alive than to turn it into charcoal or into uh, grazing land? And so you need the right incentives. Uh, and I, if I may also to the comment that Evelyn said, I, I totally agree. We need to greatly expand and accelerate adaptation adaptation measures, uh, that uh, inclusion of communities and, and knowledge, traditional knowledge in all these efforts. But right now we're in a race against time. And so we need to, again, make sure that our mind is focused on uh, limiting emissions and taking away the excess of emissions that are already in the atmosphere. That's why I also I uh, support, uh, for instance, geoengineering and reflecting back heat and so on. Yeah. We right now need every possibility to stop this, internalize, go into better economics, go into a much better future. And I think it is possible, but we need to really get into it massively. I think the advantage of harassis is it's an opportunity for people to share their wisdom and it's an opportunity to maybe do something as opposed to just talking about it. Um, I'm very conscious that everywhere I look, women are, seem to be making the buying decisions. Um, I, you know, uh, we we look at you know retail, we look at buying food, we look at all sorts of things, even buying cars. Eighty percent of the decisions are influenced by women, but nobody actually asks women a question of what they what they believe and what they should. No woman would ever sanction the destruction of their environment. No. So why are we doing it? <laughs> I, I think maybe one comment is uh, I'm fascinated about the role that women can play in uh, social and economic development. And I think uh, they bring balance in the world, you know, when, <laughs> when you tend to have only men in a room. Uh, you know, you I, I found... balance. But at the same time, I think uh, often the, the, the woman, uh, you know, um, because for historic reasons, they've been more involved in the family life. They, they care deeply for, for the kids. And I think most of the people I've met that are really anxious and desire to make a change in the area of climate, they are looking for the next generation and the generation after the next generation. Mm -hmm. And they get this, this tremendous anxiety with, okay, I had a good life. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed my life. I, I, I had a career, maybe, I, you know, I have been able to sustain for for myself. Mm. But what I have created for my kids, what is the world they are going to live in? And I think in many ways, we have done a great job. You know, we have, uh, peace has been until the war in Ukraine. Increasing. <laughs> Education has been increasing. Health has been increasing. On all aspects, uh, we are making progress. The only area where we are absolutely not making progress is the climate and the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And so I think it becomes the number one, um, you know, anxiety uh, area for people looking forward to what are we building for the next generation. And, I think and also, this is really where, you know, you get traction with people. You know, if, 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 you, if you put discuss with them the consequences of what we are doing right now and what may happen, nobody wants it. Nobody wants that for their children. Nobody. I believe we have to listen to our children calling from the future and change now. Yes. The advantage of women is they, the process of having a child is a, is a generational commitment of at least 20 odd years. So we need to be thinking in those sorts of time frames. And that's why I'm suggesting women might be quite important in this conversation. Um, I'm also, also suggesting that maybe we should... I think with women, it's a, an interesting challenge of the glass ceiling, which we all know about, but now it's called the sticky floor, which is them not believing that they can do things and needing to be overqualified before they even apply. So how do you create cohorts of women? Um, I think we've actually concluded, unfortunately. So all I can say is a real thank you for your ideas, your thoughts, your passion, and great to be with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right Thank to connect. You, yeah. Make Perfect. sure, make sure we connect afterwards as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and enjoy the rest of the day. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take Thank care. You. Bye bye. Thank Thank you. You. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye.